Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, at the onset, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Pitya Clinical Society for the excellent uh, organization of this clinical meeting and extending uh, uh, their hospitality towards uh, the Ceylon College of Physicians. Right, okay, so this is a, a fairly common um, problem that most uh, doctors would uh, generally face, uh, and that's uh, how to treat or approach uh, a, a patient who comes to you uh, with a new onset seizure. I'll be focusing mainly on adults because I'm an, an adult neurologist. Okay, uh, just to give some context, uh, so there are approximately 10% of uh, any population who would experience a seizure during their lifetime. Um, and out of which, approximately 2 to 3%. Uh, we'll have recurring seizures. Uh, so uh, just because a, a patient uh, experiences a seizure does not mean uh, that that patient might have recurring seizures and may not need uh, anti-epileptic medication. Uh, so that's the context. So let's see. Uh, uh, all right, all right. So uh, when when you're in when you when uh, when you as a doctor uh, encounter a patient who experiences a seizure, these are the, the first three questions that that should be running through your head. Right. Firstly, is this a seizure in the first place? Uh, if so, what kind? Right. And what caused it? And what should be done? Uh, you know, uh, subsequently, okay, whether we need to treat the patient or not. Uh, so these are the basic three questions which you need to answer in your head. Uh, to, to, to answer these questions, we will need to have a few basics uh, in our minds, right? Okay, so first thing is, what's a seizure, right? A seizure is, or seizure is a set of clinical symptoms as well as signs that are brought on by abnormal electrical activity uh, in the neurons of the body, the brain. And the clinical characteristics, the symptoms and the signs that these patients uh, come with or present with depends on which part of the brain is activated or uh, which part of the brain is stimulated. Uh, I'll come to that in a little while. So if uh, so you need to also understand the difference between a seizure and what, what epilepsy is. Right? So epilepsy is the propensity to have more and more seizures. Right? And these seizures are unprovoked seizures. Okay. So now, what's the difference between a provoked seizure and an unprovoked seizure? Uh, a provoked seizure is a seizure where there's, uh, there's a transient decrease in uh, the seizure threshold, right? And once you, uh, you, 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 uh, uh, you uh, treat the cause of the transient decrease in the threshold, the patient doesn't get any more seizures. So do you think these patients need long-term anti-epileptic drugs? Probably not, because what you need to do is treat the cause. Does anyone know any examples? You can shout out. So that to wake you up. No. Front look. Anything that decreases sexual transiency. We all know. Shout out. Yes. Very common. Hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, so almost any metabolic derangement that can reduce the threshold. And you treat the hypoglycemia, you treat the hyponatremia, patient doesn't get any seizures. Do they, these patients need long term anti epileptic drugs? Probably not. Okay. So that's metabolic. Any, any other causes, any inflammatory causes, infective causes? Come again? Uh, okay, yes, SLE. So uh, you treat the cause, 
the inflammation, the patient does not get any seizures. So inflammatory or infective, even encephalitis, do you think these patients need long-term antiepileptic drugs? Probably not if you treat the encephalitis. Brain injuries, you need antiepileptic drugs or not long-term? So there is a time, so it's, it's not only the insults, there's also a time frame involved in these uh, you know, insults to the brain. So if you have a, uh, say, hypoglycemia one week ago and you come with a seizure, do you think that's relevant or irrelevant? It's irrelevant. Right? So you need to have a, a metabolic derangement within 24 to 48 hours for you to attribute the seizure to that insult. Traumatic brain injury, it's a week. So if, you, if it's a seizure within a week, that's attributable to traumatic brain injury. You don't need antiepileptic drugs, long-term antiepileptic drugs for those patients. So I hope you understood the, the, uh, the concept of provoked seizures. So epilepsy is actually the propensity of seizures to occur, unprovoked seizures to occur recurrently. And these patients need long-term antiepileptic drugs. Okay, uh, sorry. Right, operational definition for epilepsy has changed, uh, and the definition has changed since 2010. So this is not recent; it has changed over the last decade. So you need to know about why, what, what the definition of epilepsy is. So prior to 2010, the definition of epilepsy was if you have two seizures which are unprovoked, 24 hours apart, that patient is classed as a patient with epilepsy. Now they've extended the definition, even if you have one seizure, so that has a clinical implication because you can start patients on long-term antiepileptic drugs, antiepileptic drugs, even after a single seizure, if their risk of seizure recurrence is greater than 60% over the next 10 years. Okay, how do I uh, calculate 60% uh, risk. So there are examples, right? Uh, uh, so the best example would be uh, if a patient, an adult patient, uh, comes with a seizure, maybe two months after a stroke, and the seizure is attributed to uh, the, uh, the, the same area as that of the stroke, that patient has a risk of recurrence of over 70% over the next 10 years. Okay, so that particular patient will need long term antiepileptic drugs. That patient will be classed as a patient with epilepsy. Okay, so that's why they've included the second uh, clause that even a single seizure can give rise to an increased risk of. Uh, epilepsy or, or, or seizure recurrence and therefore these patients can be uh, classed as uh, patients with uh, epilepsy. All right, uh, I'm not going to touch about epilepsy syndromes. Anyone knows about a, a, an example of epilepsy syndromes? Any genetic generalized epilepsy you all know of that comes, off, comes on in adolescence? Needs lifelong anti-epileptic drugs. I'm, I'm, the pediatricians know of uh, uh, epilepsy syndromes because they are the patients, the people, sorry, the, uh, doctors who actually uh, treat a lot of epilepsy syndromes. So, uh, stereotypical example would be benign epilepsy with central temporal spikes. Yes, even a single seizure with a typical EEG, typical seizure semiology, you'll be able to diagnose epilepsy in those patients. And that's because they, we class all these patients with, this, with similar seizure types, age of onset, the typical EEG, all those uh, uh, features, we class them into one, and then we, we call the, those patients to have a syndrome. So you, you'll be able to, even with a single seizure, typical EEG, diagnose an epilepsy syndrome in those patients. So uh, pediatricians will know a little bit about that. In our setting, anyone heard about juvenile myoclonic epilepsy? Yes, 
right? So after it's most often than not, they come to you with a generalized tonic tonic seizure, right? And if you actually go into the history, you, you might see that they might have subtle marker injuries, maybe a little bit of absence seizures where they say a little bit, but they come to you with the first generalized tonic tonic seizure. You do the EEG, they have typical EEG pattern, cross the MS, juvenile macular epilepsy. All right, those patients need long term anti epileptic drugs, at least uh, not long term, but lifelong. Okay. Right. So, you know, now the difference between a seizure, epilepsy, um, epilepsy is the recurring uh, disorder where there are seizures. Uh, so, you need to also class every time you, you come up. Uh, you encounter a patient with a seizure, you need to class them, right? Am I dealing with a generalized seizure? Am I dealing with a focal seizure or a focal onset seizure, previously called partial seizures? Or is this a seizure which I cannot classify or unclassify seizures, right? So what's a generalized seizure? A generalized seizure, uh, there are some examples, the quintessential um, or stereotypical example of a generalized seizure, generalized tonic tonic seizure. Now, the, what's the difference between focal onset seizures and generalized seizure is, is that both there is activation of both sides of your brain in a generalized seizure, and it is nearly simultaneous. It's not really simultaneous. It starts from one focus, spreads very rapidly to involve both hemispheres. However, though it's, it starts from one side of the brain, it's not consistent. Example, say you have a seizure, one seizure that occurs today from the right frontal area, right? The next seizure might be from the left temporal region. The third seizure might be from the occipital region, right? So there is no consistent site in which these seizures arise. And we will not be able to even, it's so rapid, we don't see it on surface EEG. We put the EEG on, right? We don't, we don't really see it. So those are what we call generalized seizures. It's very important for us to classify these seizures because it has an implication on, on treatment, right? Uh, we'll go on to that in a little while. So you need to understand. So when you're taking the history, you need to classify whether this is a generalized seizure or not. And these are examples of, of a generalized seizure. Right. So, focal seizures are seizures that consistently start from one side of the brain, right? One hemisphere. It can spread to the other side, but it's consistently starting from one. Say, for example, every seizure will start from the right temporal, medial temporal region, right? So, in that particular patient, all his seizures or her seizures will start from the right medial temporal region. It can spread to the other side. If it spreads, then you see a secondary generalized tonic tonic seizure, which is now no longer called a secondary generalized seizure. It's called focal to tonic tonic seizure. So the nomenclature has changed, but uh, that changed in 2017. Right? So uh, again, examples for focal onset seizures are simple partial seizures, which are now called focal onset seizures with retained uh, awareness. Then complex partial seizures, which you're all aware of, is the stereotypical temporal lobe seizure where you lose awareness. And then we have the partial seizures in secondary generalization. Again, uh, the nomenclature has changed. Right, so this is the seizure classification. Uh, since of 2017, I uh, uh, would like you all to actually go through it. Uh, it's fairly simple. What you need to know is actually the first year alone. So is, is this focal onset or is this generalized onset or unknown onset? Whether there is a, a retained awareness or uh, impaired awareness has absolutely doesn't really have any clinical implication. So if you can, if you are able to sort of classify these into these three groups, the seizure, that will be great because that will have. Uh, an implication on uh, if you uh, want to start anti-epileptic drugs, which drug to start, 
uh, might, uh, you know, your, your the, the type of seizure might determine, determine the type of drug that you start on. Okay, so this is just uh, an idea as to what the seizure classification looks like. Right. So why have I put this picture? This is a picture of the brain, obviously, and the various functional areas. So if you have an idea, a good idea, of, or at least a relatively good idea of functional neuron anatomy, you might be able to what? identify where these seizures are coming from. Right. Just a simple example. So if, if you have chronic movements involving the right arm, right? Where do you think these uh, seizures are coming from? It has to be from the motor area, simple motor strip on the opposite side. Yes, very simple, right? If a patient comes with a left-sided visual field um, or where they, where they see um, uh, colored blobs, right, like a torana, right, then these pa the, the seizures are coming from which side? The primary visual area, which is found in the occipital region on the opposite side, right? If the patient comes with a buzzing sound on, on the right, right, which is a auditory aura, where do these seizures come from? The opposite auditory uh, cortex, which is called, called the hesus divus. Right? So this is what we do on a daily basis as neurologists. We what do what we don't do much, but we what we do is basically try to localize and lateralize the lesion. Okay, so we, we, we are able to do that by analyzing seizure. Semiology, semiology mainly based on our knowledge on functional neuron. Okay. So, is this a seizure? First question. So, if to answer that question, you need to know what are the seizure mimics? What can look like a seizure? Very important. So, these are the list of I'm not going, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, even a longer list, right? Uh, but the first two are the most important differential diagnosis that you will generally encounter in your clinical practice, right? TIAs, hyperglycemia, parasomnias, parasomnias are most often than not seen by the pediatricians, not so much in, the, in adult neurology. Uh, hyperventilation, stereotypies, all the generally with children and Patients with who are a bit cuckoo, anxious, anxiety, right? People who have anxiety disorders can come with hyperventilation and then they might drop onto the floor, right? And they, you might put them on antiepileptic drugs, right? So you need to understand that some there are there are list of um, seizure mimics. Okay, so for us to differentiate. Uh, a seizure, we need to know what what this presentation of a syncop syncopal attack would be like, what, uh, and a non epileptic PNAS is psychogenic non epileptic seizures, right? So, you need to differentiate between us, yeah, seizure, right? So, what are the main predictors? This is a disease slide, I apologize for that. Uh, so, what are the main predictors of what a generalized seizure looks like? predictors right so if these are there you're most likely dealing with a generalized seizure if these are there you're most likely dealing with syn uh, syncopal attack or uh, um, you know uh, vasovagal syncope if these are there these are more likely to be non epileptic seizures right so best predictor is if the patient is cyanosed because of hypoxia as to that of pallor which is more commonly seen with syncope. You're dealing with more likely a generalized seizure. Right? The ictal cry. That's the sound you generally hear. You can always 
mimic that with your patient because if you don't it's because the the my the, the the diaphragm there's an increased tone in the in uh, the diaphragm it pushes the, the air out against a closed blood disc because there's increased tone in the upper air that's that's what you why we hear the inter cry right so if you hear an inter cry or you ask the patient well, did the patient sound like this when 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 he was seizing you're more likely dealing with a generalized seizure right if you have a lateral tongue uh, you know tongue bite involved in the lateral aspect of your tongue hundred percent specificity right according to not i'm not the one who's selling this uh, there's, there's been a lot of research going into this so it's nearly 100 percent specific specific seen in about uh, approximately one in five patients with generalized seizures one in five so if you have a tongue bite involved in the lateral aspect of your tongue or posterior dislocation right of your shoulder you're more likely dealing with a generalized seizure okay the level of unconsciousness if it's long lasting longer lasting right more than five minutes again generalized seizure confusion post ictally seizure drowsiness headache and so on and so forth so you need to be aware of what the predictors are for generalized seizure syncope right often antiepileptic drugs are started on patients with syncope right they have a aura meaning they will have a uh, they will have visual blurring diaphoresis very specific if the patient starts sweating prior to the prior to the event that's a bit a little atypical for a seizure right? so you need to ask for that the feeling of warmth right and very short lasting loss of consciousness rapid recovery no confusion right those are all predictors of a, of syncope but you know there is a caveat right there is always you need to be very careful what can happen if the syncope lasts for a little more longer right you can have what's called an anoxic seizure or activation of the reticular bonds where right you can have a little bit of myoclonus you can have a little bit of increased tone or you you can even have automatisms which you see with temporal lobe seizures where you have chewing movements right they can have gestural automatisms like this right these also can be seen with syncope right so you need to be very very careful uh, when analyzing the semiology where you don't really there's no point in starting antiepileptic drugs for those patients right how do you how do you know that this is uh, an anoxic seizure the recovery is very quick and there is very little post ictal confusion following this uh, activation of the reticular bond so the post ictal state is very important when you are asking for the history predictors of non epileptic seizures they have they are they are prolonged if a, if a patient comes to you and says i had a seizure for 3 hours is not in status is probably having non epileptic seizure right if the seizures go wax and wane wax and wane they go in and out in and out again most likely the patient is not having status right because the patient is nicely talking to you if you had a status epileptic status at home you would have cognitive deficit by right right so waxing waning pattern if there is ictal like closure if the patient shuts her, his or her eyes it's mainly a her i'm sorry to discriminate right it's generally a her that comes to you right and closes your eyes right while the seizures are occurring again probable probable non epileptic seizures side to side movements right i think of non epileptic seizures pelvic thrusting right caveat again we can be certain frontal lobe seizures can mimic these non epileptic seizures so it's generally the seizures you you non epileptic seizures vary from seizure to seizure a true seizure generally is stereotypical they it's the same thing day in day out so it's very important for you to uh, get the sequence of events all right so i'll move on 
right so diagnosis of see uh, seizure is based on what what investigation no investigations it's only history your diagnosis of epilepsy your diagnosis of seizures then no uh, investigation in the world that will either confirm or refute your diagnosis it's the only thing is a proper history right which is not done in most cases how is a proper history taken from a patient who has seizures you need at least three people yourself the patient and the fellow who actually saw the seizure right and if you don't have that do not say that this patient has epilepsy and start an antidepressant drug and send the patient home why because you are putting them you are crossing them as an epileptic patient for the probably the next rest of their lives because it will be continue all for the duration of that clinic book okay right so history is the most important thing so you need to ask what any triggers the description of the actual episode what happened before and what happened after okay uh, so i'm going to run uh, because of the lack of time uh, so these are the 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 etiologies which i have actually spoken of Uh, previously so i'm not going to waste time on this slide these are all causes of of seizures which we uh, uh, discussed before diagnostic tests these are these diagnostic tests are done to see whether these are provoked or unprovoked seizures right you make the diagnosis right and then you find out whether these are provoked or unprovoked seizures why you do you check your calcium you check your metabolic screen why to see whether was a provoked seizure or an unprovoked seizure you do your urine toxicology again provoked seizure or unprovoked seizure in selected people who you think are at risk of toxic encephalopathy the eeg is useful to predict recurrence right so if you see epileptic discharges on your eeg that patient is going to have high a higher risk of seizure recurrence and that's why we use the eeg the eeg has the highest seal within the uh, within 24 to 48 hours after a seizure however 50% of your eeg is will be normal right so you don't wait for the eeg to diagnose that this patient has got a seizure okay so uh, you know, a lot of people send eegs to diagnose seizure that's not the that's not why the eeg is used the eeg is used to risk stratify your chance of having a seizure right i'm not going to go to ambulatory eeg right imaging why is imaging used again risk stratification as well as find whether this is a provoked or unprovoked seizure if the patient has a tumor most likely or a stroke within and the, and the seizure occurred within a week of the stroke this is a provoked seizure treat the cause treat the tumor right why do we uh, so that's one reason why we do imaging second reason is if this patient at is this patient at a higher risk of seizure recurrence oh, so any structural lesion which is attributable to the seizure is more likely to have recurring seizures so that's why we need imaging all right ct brain is more than adequate for you uh, to make that uh, decision an mri would be ideal because sometimes uh, certain uh, pathologies might be more uh, apparent on mri uh, for example the pediatrician did not uh, malformations of cortical development um, are mainly picked up through mr imaging so ideal mr but uh, in a resource poor setting i would see it would be adequate so decision to treat or not to treat is the so you need to balance the risk of recurrence versus right the the risk of what risk of having adverse events uh 
with your treatment okay right uh, so the risk of recurrence after a single seizure is approximately 20 to 30 percent over the next 10 years risk of uh, recurrence of a second seizure is more than 60 percent after a third seizure 70 percent so as the seizures uh, keep accumulating the chance of recurrence gets higher and higher and higher so how how does this risk of seizure increase to more than 60 percent after a single seizure if the patient has a structural lesion if the patient has EEG changes, specifically generalized epileptiform discharges, if the patient has nocturnal seizures, uh, you know they are they are more likely to have recurrence, and that's how you risk study. Risk of having another seizure. So if you need to counsel the patient, right? So if the patient, if you decide not to start the patient on anti drugs, the highest risk of recurrence is within the first two years. You need to tell them that they can have, they are liable to injury. So they, if they have a seizure in a bad place, like in a while driving a car, climbing, uh, riding a bicycle, they're more likely to have a injurious, you know, have a, a fatal accident. The other thing is, most seizures terminate. Ninety-nine percent of your seizures terminate within two minutes. Most of them within one minute. Right? If they last for more than three minutes or five minutes, I would suggest that these patients need to go into hospital, the closest hospital, because that particular seizure is going to go on and on and on. Right? A prolonged seizure, and that can cause mycopsic damage to your brain. And also, there is also an entity called sudden unknown death in epilepsy, it's called SUDEP, and that has, that, there is a chance of less than 1%. Uh, if a patient is untreated, medication side. So what we what we start these antiepileptic drugs are not benign. They can affect quality of life. They can have very severe reactions, such as Steven Johnson's toxic epidermal necrosis, acute fever failure. All of which are can be detrimental to the patient. So don't uh, take starting antiepileptic drugs lightly, and also the social stigma. So you need to discuss the risk versus benefit of starting an antiepileptic drug. Uh, preferably, if you do start on antiepileptic drugs, it should be monotherapy with uh, uh, with uh, incremental dose, starting from the lowest possible dose. And your seizure, the antiepileptic, the drug of choice would depend on age of the patient, sex of the patient. Why? If the patient is, for example, a female in the reproductive age, would you start on valprate? Probably not. Right. So the, the, the sex of the patient also is um, important. Okay, the last slide, I think. Okay, so your anticonvulsant medication. You remember, you need to classify the, the seizures, the first few slides. This is why the, your choice of antiepileptic drug will depend on what type of seizure. So if it's a generalized seizure, these are the list of drugs which you can start. If it's a focal seizure, these are the drugs that you can uh, start on a focal onset seizure. Why is because certain drugs can worsen seizures. For example, if you start carbospin on, say, say uh, for a patient with childhood absence epilepsy in the pediatric age group, they can go into absence status. Same thing for uh, adults, if the patient has a generalized uh, epilepsy, if you start them on a sodium channel blocker like half spin peritone, you might push them into status. So it's important for you to understand what type of seizure you're dealing with. Right, last slide. So this is the algorithm that you generally use, right? I know it's not very clear. Uh, so unprovoked seizure, if, the, if you have prior brain lesion, if you have EEG um, with epileptic form discharges, a significant brain in, uh, imaging pathology, and nocturnal seizures, you are at higher risk of having seizures. So there you start the on antiepileptic drugs. If not, then you need to consider other factors. Is the patient having a, uh, is, he, is involved in a, uh, you know, occupation where he really can't afford to have another seizure? Then you might decide, okay, we start this patient on antiepileptic drugs. So uh, there are other contextual um, uh, factors which you need to consider when starting antiepileptic drugs. And if it's a focal seizure, I've given you the drugs that you need to start on. If it's a generalized seizure or an unclassified seizure, 
right? You would generally use a broad spectrum anti-epileptic drug. Okay, that's all I have to say. I